guys, Chris McDougal here. So uh, I'm really excited to share this latest uh, adventure that we did uh, up to Panamint City uh, with the Death Valley Boys in October of uh, 2020. Um, to get there, it's about eight hours from the Central Coast and um, you end up, uh, the first thing you do is you cross the Panamint uh, Valley, which is, uh, it's the next valley over from Death Valley. And um, it's just beautiful. Here's Panamint Valley. Valley, which is absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous valley here. Where we're going is up in those mountains, and on the video it doesn't look too big, but trust me, that's that's six, seven, eight thousand feet right there. The first little town you come to is Ballarat, which is uh, just this little outpost uh, kind of ghost town that um, there's just one guy who lives there, Rocky, Rocky Novak. And uh, Rocky's family has been uh, living in the, uh, the Panamint Valley, I think for 30 years or 40 years or something like that. Around the turn of the last century, Ballarat had a population of around 500. It had seven saloons, three hotels, a Wells Fargo station, a school, a jail, a post office. It was a real town. In 1917, uh, the nearby Ratcliffe mine closed and the town went into decline. In 1968, Charles Manson and his followers were hiding out just to the south of here, up Coyote Canyon at Barker Ranch. Law enforcement used Ballarat as the staging area for their raid, where they found Manson, who was a little teeny tiny guy, hiding in a cabinet under a sink. One of Manson's old army trucks is still sitting in Ballarat. From here, we head up Surprise Canyon to Chris Wick Camp. This is an old mining and ore processing area. Uh, Chris Wick was a Dutchman who uh, did some prospecting in the area. He also had a soaking pool for weary travelers who were heading up to Panamint City. Apparently he was also the bartender in Ballarat. Legend has it that he brought a pool table in a, a horse and carriage down from Panamint City to his bar in Ballarat. We arrive just as the sun is starting to set. We have a few minutes to check out the riverbed to make sure it's got water. This is gonna be super important for our hike the next day. We also have a little bit of time to check out the mining equipment that's sitting around the site. Okay, here we go, walking away from base camp. I'm all fresh. It's about probably 7 a.m. We're heading up the trail. Nice bit of running water in there. Yeah, so almost immediately we're running into this thing where the the trail is the creek. Yay! So that's why we brought these. Came prepared. Jim's been whining? <laughs> Tell me more, Jim. <laughs> This sucks. Here we're coming across our first piece of equipment. Let's see what this is. Hmm. Jesus, it's barely recognizable. 
see the battery there. It's got brakes, it's got a transaxle, so it's some kind of maybe a road grader or something. Gear shift. Now I've loved tractors and bulldozers and dump trucks all my life, so this little wreck had me perplexed. After reading dozens of Panamint City blogs, I found one with a photo taken of this little thing after the 1984 flood and before the 2001 flood. It was more intact. The article referred to it as a mucker, but that's kind of a mine cart that has a little scoop on the front. It's, it's not a mucker. Uh, clear it was a mine cart of some kind. After many, many more searches, I positively identified it as a mine dump truck manufactured by Young's Machine in the late 1950s or early 1960s. Young's Machine is still in business today. Here, I'm going to go from that down to here. Whew. I'm getting tired of waterfalls. How many wild waterfalls can one man take in one day? Holy cow. It's rough. It's hard to believe now, but from 1874 to 1984, there was actually a road up this canyon. In 1984, there was a huge flash flood which scoured the floor of the canyon back to bedrock. Around 1990, Jeepers learned that they could use the old blast holes in the walls of the canyon to winch themselves up through the waterfall area. Eventually, in 2001, a lawsuit closed the canyon permanently to vehicle travel. This looks like an old, what kind of truck is it? <laughs> Say on the back anymore? No. That's a homemade tailgate for sure. Oh yeah. This thing's got patina. Ooh, custom cab. Must be a Ford, I think. Yeah, this is an old 60s Ford. This is like Sterling's old Ford. My stepdad had one about like that. We used to call it the Rape Dape. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not PC, but. What we got under here? Oh, it's still got the engine. Yeah, baby. Straight six. Woo! I know. Might take a bit to get it running again. View of the chimney. Got there. one hell of a trail it's uh i think seven seven and a half miles is what it ends up being and uh it's all uphill <laughs> the trail to panamint city is not terribly long 
It starts at an altitude of 2,640 feet above sea level and ends at 6,320 feet for a total gain in altitude of 3,680 feet. That kicked our butts. We did it in five hours. Other hikers said that it took them 12 hours. Two abandoned backpacks we saw along the way showed where other hikers had given up. If you're gonna go, leave early, pack light, and remember that there is water around the 3.7 mile mark at Brewery Springs. There's been a brewery around here somewhere. This is coming right out of a rock. After a few hours rest, the boys and I were ready for a little bit of exploration. We decided to explore the mine that was just up above our campsite. Okay, here we go. In 1872, three stagecoach robbers, William Kennedy, Robert Stewart, and Richard Jacobs, were hiding out in caves in Surprise Canyon after liberating $12,000 from stagecoaches in the area. They did some prospecting to pass the time and found high-grade silver ore near what is now Panamint City. Once word got out about the strike, it gained the attention of Nevada Senator William Stewart and J.P. Jones, who raised $14,000 to build a road to the site. These two had already amassed a sizable fortune from their holdings in the Comstock Lode in Virginia City. Legend has it that part of the deal for the purchase of the mines was a stipulation that the $12,000 which was stolen be repaid to Wells Fargo. In all, they paid $350,000 buying up the mines in the area. From 1874 to 1876, the town boomed. It swelled to 2,000 people with 50 wooden structures. In 1875, the Surprise Valley 20 stamp mill opened for business and was soon processing many tons of ore a day. The ore was smelted on site into 450 pound balls of silver which were transported out of town on wagons without armed guard because they were too heavy and awkward to steal. Unfortunately, the boom was not to last. The strike, which was supposed to rival the Comstock load, started to have trouble when the Workmen and Temple Bank that was financing the railroad to the site went bankrupt. By November of 1875, the quality of ore was already declining and many headed out for other richer sites. 
Then, on July 24th, 1876, a huge storm washed a good portion of the town down the canyon. Our first order of business in the morning is getting water. There are two reliable sources, one just above town at a large spring-fed green water tank to the side of the road, and the other up Sourdough Canyon. They are both about 15 minutes walk from downtown. We choose Sourdough Canyon because of the opportunity to explore the castle, which is the best preserved cabin in the area. How am I looking? I haven't even, I haven't even seen myself. Ugh, God. Okay. Well, so the other thing about that's cool about the castle is that there's there's tons of like I don't know you can't you can hardly see it down there, but there's all kinds of trucks and tractors and crap that we're gonna explore. Can't wait. So the boys haven't come yet. I had I was really dehydrated. Had to get some water. So I came and the water was running, ready to go. I'm filtering right here. In fact, I'm over filtering now. A little drone action. Ooh, look at that gimbal. The gimbal sees all. Oh, I can see you. Bed. Ooh, the interior could use a little sprucing up. Oh, yeah. This is a Interesting little fact on these on these big old uh, diesel motors that are massive like this. I think this is probably an eight cylinder, straight eight. But see this little motor right here, this little guy right here. That's the motor to start the motor. <laughs> it's, it's like a two cylinder motor to get the first, the other motor going. Isn't that amazing? And the big motor is behind it. Look at the size of this radiator. This radiator is just, it's got to be four feet tall. Now that's a big bulldozer. <laughs> oh God. Now this thing I just love. This is a Chrysler Nissan V8 generator with fuel injection and believe it or not, a blower. Putting out a total of 265 horsepower at around 2000 RPM. God, it's sexy.
compressor? Yeah. Oh my god. Jeff. Martin. Yeah. That looks like a hefty repair there. <laughs> One mile. Oh, till we get in the water? <laughs> yeah. I got some more of that tape. It's in my uh, first aid kit that's somewhere down on the trail. Oh my God, it's epic. Uh -oh. I didn't like that. Now there was four. <laughs> I didn't like either of those things. Okay. So what would I do next time? On this, I wouldn't carry so much water, believe it or not. There's a lot of places to get water coming up. I think 3.7 miles up the canyon. There's a great spot to get water. Uh, the other thing I would bring, electrolyte solution. Um, that's important. And uh, the other thing I would do is I would bring bug spray. <sighs> We're here mid-October. The bugs are like driving me crazy. Anyway, that's what I would do. Tonight I'm dancing round this fire Kicking up some dust Raising one big holy rack To the heavens above And I'm dancing with my shadow Like a scarecrow with the wind Some ancient rhythm calls me Back to the mystery again Down these back roads From the east out to the west I have gathered seeds of truth Along the way found blessedness Like the north star calls the geese back home Something calls to me Like a sparrow on a fence post I feel the need to sing Oh, calling Yeah, calling me Yeah, calling me back to the mystery